What up, everybody, and welcome to the Overseas Famous Podcast. Tonight, we are talking a little mystery. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen overseas that people don't really know about, and that's kind of what the podcast has done. That's what the book has done, kind of shed some light. However, there's a lot of things that still are unsolved, and the story that we're going to talk about tonight is a uh, unsolved, really, case of American who played in Brazil, ends up... Uh, dead and there's a lot going on with this so we're gonna get into this tonight because a little uh mystery mystery theater and try to figure out exactly you know what the shit is going on so welcome the team john michaela matt what's up guys how was the week everyone doing okay michaela got a new webcam i saw michaela was playing with all the different colors a few seconds ago. It came really hot, and I was like, why do I look purple? Like, that's not good. But we're saving up for a new laptop, but this is just going to be, like, a little piece holder. Low energy tonight, guys. I don't... I, don't I got I got my drink. This is what happens when Kev decides to do, to do shit at, like, 9 o'clock at night when it feels like midnight for me. It's so late. It's so late. It's now, so late. I have to ask you, Kev. Yeah. It, we're going with the mystery theme tonight. It's getting close to being like Halloween and shit like yeah. that. Did you wear the Blair Witch cap on purpose? No, but it's weird. <laughs> uh, it's weird because I feel like I, I don't have clothes. Like, I don't have any fucking clothes. Like, everything I own, I have, like, nice clothes. That well, I'll for wear. those of you listening at, uh, listening at home at oh, KFP, yeah. Kev is basically shirtless right now. Yeah, I've, like, so, <laughs> listen. Okay, so, li- no, I'll just describe what I'm wearing uh, in a non-sexual way for the what audience. are you wearing <laughs> exactly so i don't have clothes like i feel like i have nice clothes that i dress up in and then there's like there's nothing in between like it's like clothes that i work out in and clothes that i dress up in and then there's nothing else in between so when i end up doing a podcast i'm not going to dress up because it's like the middle of the night right now so i'm not going to dress up for it but at the same time i'm also not going to you know like like you're like i'm not going to go shirtless so i have to put something on so i just rock like a tank top or something to stay i'm also in my office my office is not the most you know like there's not a lot of flow through here so it gets real hot and then when you know you're getting sweaty so i try to go bare minimum clothing you don't even want to see what i'm wearing underneath but for all you ladies out like down yeah down south it's short shorts we're going 80s style <laughs> so there's a podcast for us michaela and matt we're gonna dress a six foot 11 man that would be a good one we'll take yeah, a good yeah good luck you better you better get online and, and order <laughs> clothes there you're not gonna find anything in the store <laughs> oh, um, man. all right so we're diving into this case um So there's this crazy story and it's kind of a, you know, I know Aaron uh, will be able to hop on tonight and uh, hopefully join us. Uh, He was in Argentina when this happened. Now this occurred in Brazil. The guy's name is Tony Harris. And uh, one of these things, when we do something like this, uh, it's, it's within like all due respect to the family, um, to the loved ones of Tony Uh, The reason we do this podcast is we want to share stories. Um, Our listeners are mostly uh, people who love overseas sports and overseas athletes themselves. So when we put something up like this, we want you guys to kind of have a lot of stories of what goes on, of the real story. So when we put this out, it's uh, with all due respect to the family. um, It is just trying to kind of look at a case where something went horribly wrong and we don't really know the uh the actual outcome because it's an unsolved case and uh we're gonna kind of dive into that tonight so uh tony harris so here's the gist of the tony harris case so tony harris played basketball uh washington state university uh ends up playing a, a long pro career uh was in south korea for a little bit ends up going to brazil and playing there for a few years uh, really dominates the league. One of the best players in league history in Brazil. Um, ends up uh, the one year getting in some some sort of trouble where the reports were when he finally talked to his wife uh, or his new wife, um, he said 
something happened the year before where he slept with someone's wife. So he slept with someone's wife. Now, I don't think it was just a someone like a random person. It was probably someone pretty powerful because from that point on, he was super paranoid, um, but came back to Brazil the following year, even though he was like freaked out, completely paranoid. There's a lot of crazy emails back home saying, you know, if something happens that, you know, they got me. Uh, there was this paranoia that teammates noticed. It was just a crazy situation. Um, he ends up disappearing and kind of like almost living in the woods for a while because he was almost hiding out, uh, was so freaked out, was so paranoid. And then uh, a few weeks, uh, like a few days later, uh, disappeared. No one sees him again for a while. They end up going to the woods, this really isolated place. And it, uh, it would appear that it was a suicide that he hung himself. However, there's a lot of weird things going on with that. Uh, the sh he had shoes on with both the shoelaces, but there was a shoelace that he hung himself with that just kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, there's two cigarette butts uh, at the scene of the crime or at the scene. Um, and there was just a lot of inconsistencies. Um, his body, by the time they found it, was very de decomposed, but they cremated him. And there was not a lot of like detective work done to kind of figure out why and what exactly happened. Uh, so there was just a lot of weird inconsistencies. And the fact that he was so paranoid makes it believe that it's just an odd case. And especially when we look at this whole entire thing as a, in general and just be like, wow, what the hell happened? Uh, you kind of are put in a situation where it's this mystery. When you go overseas, like shit's real. Like you can end up in a bad situation really quick. And it's just life. I mean, there's, you, you can get hurt. There's, there's a story, a uh, guy got knocked out of a bar in Romania, ended up like hitting his head, ended up dying, played, you know, it was American playing basketball over there, just got into a fight, unfortunate thing. Uh, so it's just like, you know, you're just in, you're in a different country. You're not really, it's not America where you, you have those subtle differences and you kind of like control the situation it's a very out of your control, so it's a little scary. So, uh, yeah, we're do you want to pop Aaron in here? Because he, I know he's got a lot of information uh, about this guy. Yeah, Aaron just popped on. Let's get him in here. Here he comes. For those of you who don't we, know, Aaron blogs for Overseas Famous as well. So he's a writer. He does some blogs. So we're going to give Aaron some credit for the extra work he does on the side. Yes. So, uh, Aaron Maxey, one of our, one of the team here, uh, one of the family here, uh, joining us, obviously, uh, check out his blog and his blog on, uh, our overseas famous. It's awesome. Uh, we've talked to Aaron a bunch of before, obviously he's, he's doing things at 40, 42, right, Aaron? 42, yeah, 42 that like I couldn't do when I was 28. So it's like an incredible <laughs> thing. Uh, that he's doing. So, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. No, nah, thanks for having me. No, it's super. It's it's cool. So we're we're talking because we we dove in with a lot of stuff with uh, a lot of the scary things that can happen with overseas basketball. We're talking about the case uh, with Tony Harris uh, when he was in Brazil and ends up, you know, dead. And it's like ruled kind of a suicide, but there was no real official cause of death ruled. Uh, you were in Argentina when this happened, right? Yeah, I, I was in Argentina. Um, I think you were in New Zealand because this was like 2008. Yes. 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. And the situation over in Romania had happened like that. I think it was that year or the year after. Yep. It was yeah, it was right around that time. Yeah. So, um, you know, just being, you know, in Argentina, being next door to Brazil and just hearing the story. um. It was, for me, it wasn't necessarily a reality check, but it just, you know, it lets you know that being in South America, that, you know, there really wasn't a, a huge value on life. And a lot of people, I, I think in general, they really don't understand that when we do go abroad, you know, and you go to some of these different countries, life isn't valued the same way that we look at. It. You know, a little bit of money can call you to be expendable. It's... It is, it's a scary thing because 
You're right. I don't think the we we put a lot of emphasis on uh, you know, those those little things, uh, you know, enjoying life and living a long, prosperous life and this this dream. And in other countries, it's not like that. It's very expendable. People like I think back to even just the the historical significance of some of these cultures and you know different cultures uh viking culture i know like nordic culture it was like you know they wanted to die in battle it was like their religion that if they died in battle they would go to valhalla and it's just this crazy thing where they don't the life is almost like part of the journey of what's going on and we almost value life as like, this is, this is the big thing, obviously, you know, whatever happens and whatever you believe in the afterlife, but this is like a huge important part. And this is the biggest part. And I think people in other countries are just kind of like, nah, you know, this is, this is just the stepping stone towards whatever is coming after. Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree. Um, you know, you look at the different cultures, you look at the different religions, you know, some people want to die in battle. Some people, you know, they say if they reach a particular you know, level, then they are, you know, immortal and live with the gods. You know, you have a lot of different things, but ultimately in a lot, especially a lot of these third world countries that, you know, we visited, you know, life is just looked at differently. You know, people are trying to get to whatever they, whatever level they feel is going to make life a little bit easier. You know, where, you know, I might be a street hustler. I got to pick pockets. The next thing up might be, you know, I'm robbing, you know, fruit stands to be able to get fruit. And that's a little bit easier than having to pick pockets. You know, what's the next level up? Then I might have to start, um, you know, shanking people to get pocketbooks. You know, but with whatever it is, there's always another level that somebody's you know, trying to get to because how they view it and what they dream is, you know, uh, virtually making it. I mean, here in the States, the dope man, you know, the dope man might be passing out, you know, food to people in the neighborhood, you know, doing a lot of good. But at the same time, He's bumping people off. He's selling drugs. He's doing, you know, whatever out there. So you have that catch 22 as far as what is it really good or is it bad? But as far as with the person who has nothing, they're seeing these things. And it's like, hey, you know what? That's they have more than what I do. People give them respect. People see them in a particular way. And going to, you know, that the, the Tony Harris story, you know, with the things that I had heard, you know, which, you know, reading the article hear what's going on here, what's going on with, you know, some of the local, um, uh, you know, Brazilian players within the league, you know, dudes fooling around with the owner's wife. He gives her a pass, gives them a pass. Hey, quit fooling around with my wife. You know, I already know what it is. Let it go. But whatever reason it was, you've been given a pass, drop it. But you, you know, we don't know what, what continues, but what we do know what ends up happening. So obviously something went on. Yeah. You know, the story's a little gray. Did he go back? Did he just, you know, say, hey, whatever, you know, speak whatever I'm going to do me. But as you and I both know, there are a handful of guys who go abroad and you can't say anything to them because they are whoever they want to be. And nobody can tell them anything. It's true, especially when it comes to a situations like this, being a pro athlete, you're people are drawn to you. So you're going to get a lot more attention. We've talked about this in the show before. You're constantly going to be the looked at in a different way, women, uh, things like that. So when you have that kind of pull, it's tough, but you have to, you know, be smart because that's something that really could be your downfall. I mean, you mess around with someone who's gotten a lot of power and a lot of, um, you know, what's the word like? Influence. Influence on uh, what could happen in like a bad way you're really putting yourself in a bad situation. And like you said, uh, the stories he got and kind of got a pass. Uh, they kind of brought him back. It's almost like a different team kind of brought him back and was just like, bring, get him back here. He's, you know, not, didn't learn his lesson. We got to take care of it. And those are things like you were saying before, a lot of the, a lot of the, the, that respect is, worth a life and i think that just, like you said we're we talk about america you know i'm sitting there someone bumps into me or someone does something to me i'm like all right whatever you know i'm like more of a just like chill just whatever but in like you said in other countries 
It's like, no, like you disrespected me, like you're going to pay for it with your life. And there's nothing that anyone can do to stop it. This is just how it is. And uh, we don't know, like, we don't know what ended up happening because there's like the psychosis that went down before where he's like freaking out. There's so many emails, like, I don't know what's going on. Everyone's, I'm going to die. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. He obviously, there was like weird things that was going on in his hotel room. Uh, It became like a, a freaky thing. And obviously the team had the passport. Were you in situations like that? Because this is something when I was looking at this and looking into this this week, the passport thing, I felt like I did the same thing. I gave the team my passport because we had to travel out of the country a lot. Like a lot of the places, especially in Europe and stuff, it's like, here's my passport. And they just take it and because they want to be in control to be like, okay, here's here. We're going to Lithuania. We're going here. We got to show it. Did your team take your passport as well? Um, a couple of teams in Argentina, they did because they'd have to show, you know, your passport before every game. You know, and then once you hit a particular point in the, se- in the season, then they stopped, you know, needing your passport. Same thing in Uruguay when I played there. Um, I'm thinking e- even when I was in, uh, in Australia, you know, when we go and play against um, the Breakers, you know, they, you know, they had your passport. You know, what, you know, and those are places where you really don't need it. Um, I know with certain times when I was in uh, Argentina, there were things that were going on. So they'd have police checks just throughout cities, you know, check to make sure your paperwork was good. And all they do is just look at the stamp and just, you know, let you keep moving. But um, yeah, I mean, with certain places, you did have the team controlling your passport, but you never really thought twice about it. I just, I keep thinking back to the, just the safety and how safe uh, American players, most of, I mean, I know when I was in Australia, I felt safe in terms of human beings, uh, every animal I was terrified of, but you know, you felt, you felt safe in regards to that. Uh, but there's so many stories. I mean, there's stories, uh, you know, that we've heard of from the people playing in Syria and uh, some of the, some Middle Eastern countries where there's been, you know, uprisings and stuff while they're playing. Um, stories like that. But the the story of just playing and everything else in the world is completely normal. But you're in a situation where like you're going to be gunned down like you're you know, your time is coming and there's nothing you can do about it. Because when you try to leave, if you don't have your passport, you're not going to get far. And it's like that control that they have to keep you in place uh, is scary. And we talk a lot about control that teams have over you overseas and especially when you're in somewhere where you're not familiar with and you don't know the customs you don't know anything it's terrifying it's a terrifying ordeal yeah i agree 100 percent. and that's where for myself i just started telling like hey give me my passport back after every every game you know you, you never knew what was going to happen you never knew if you're going to get you know especially when my money was being late give me my passport because i may have to leave tonight you know and it, it was that situation where there are times where it's like, hey, you know what? They haven't paid. They've been late. They said that they're going to double up on the money. They haven't done so. So now I got to start making some decisions. You know, what, what's going to be my next move? Um, but I'm not going to allow them to dangle my passport in front of me like a carrot in front of a donkey just to keep me there and to keep me working virtually for free. Because that's literally what happened to me when I was in Hungary. You know, and it, ha- and it wasn't just me, it was the whole team. Everybody had that same situation. So it got to the point when we were three and a half months in the hole. Well, what are we going to do? Yeah. It's when they when they stop paying you. So take us through, because I don't feel like, I, I feel like I haven't heard the story of Hungary. So take us through that situation. You're in Hungary. They have your passport and they just stop paying you. Well, they didn't have our passports. Everybody had their passport, but the team stopped paying everybody after... I want to say it's like the second month. In the second or third month, they stopped paying. This is 2005, 2006. And as far as with the, the league, there's basically two agencies that kind of brought all you know the, the players in, whether you're a European foreigner who played as a local or American foreigner. You know, that's how you, know, you, you, you got to the teams. But anyways, as far as with our team, we were three and a half months in the hole. Yeah, and they'd go ahead and give us the the chicken fee where you might end up with like $327.15. And that's what everybody got paid, you know, just to try to keep you there and say, hey, you know, the money's coming, we're, we're going to get it, you know, blah, blah, blah. But seeing what was happening, seeing what was going on, the restaurants that you're eating at are saying, hey, we're, 
you know, it's not you, but we can't feed you anymore because we haven't been paid for three months. It's like, hey, well, we're all on the same boat. You know, nobody's been paid. So with that, you know, you're sitting there, you're waiting. And then depending on the situation, you get a bit of a lump sum that comes in. And I ended up getting a majority of my money and that came over the summer because they ended up having like a, a player's union because teams were notorious for not playing, paying players. But some of those places, like when I was in Argentina, I ended up leaving, you know, some change over there. And it was a, it was a lot of it because it was, hey, don't worry about it. We'll get it to you. Agent, no, don't worry about it. We'll get it to you. No, we're not going to, I'm going to worry about it because there's a lot of money. <laughs> you know, and it's one of those things you start knocking on doors, you're doing that kind of stuff. And nobody has anything because they really don't have anything. Yeah. You know, so then you're looking at your, your contract and your contract's not worth anything more than the ink and the paper. So again, what do you do? Then you start looking at making some moves. Yeah, this is good. Aaron, when you were in Argentina, how fast did you hear about the Tony Harris story? I think it was probably within, within the week, you know, that it happened. Dang. That's crazy. How I mean, obviously, Argentina and Brazil, very close. Um, and that South American League, I guess if, if we're playing, I'm thinking about it, if we're in Australia and you're playing in like the NBL 2 or NBL 1 and you hear something that goes on in New Zealand, obviously you'd hear because it's probably similar. Right, it's going to be a similar of, thing. You have yeah. enough people kind of going back and forth. You're seeing games on TV. Um, you know, So you're able to kind of follow a few of the leagues in the region. It's crazy. So when you look at it and you look at this case and you look at, uh, you know, he's he's found uh, there's a shoelace around his neck. He has both his shoelaces on his shoes. Uh, there's like some inconsistency, cigarette butts around his right. body, no lighter, no wallet, no watch, uh, lots of things. When you look at this and you think about it as a professional basketball player, where do you, where do you where do you go? What do you think would occur in a situation like this? Do you think this was this was straight up the team, or do you think it was a mental breakdown from uh, Tony's part? I don't think it was Tony. I think it was personal. Yeah. You know, and as we're talking about influential people, and and you know, there's certain towns you go to, the guy who owns the team, he has the mo most money in the town. Yeah. You know, he's able to control the police. He controls what's going on, he, or he's at least, he knows everything that's going on in his city. So if it's something where, you know, you're feeling disrespected, the police ain't going to say anything because you control the police. Yeah. Did that yeah. change your, did that change like how you felt even when you heard that story, you're in Argentina and it's Brazil, but you still know that it's similar in terms of customs. It's similar in terms of, you know, how things roll down in South America did it change how you kind of uh, how you how you felt uh, going in a day to day basis when you heard that story? No, it stayed the same because I, my my theory is with what I don't what, if I don't do it here at home, I'm not doing it away <laughs> from home. And I'll, I'll tell you this much: a girl I dated in Argentina for a bunch of years, she still carries a little something in her, in her purse. She carries, and that's for protection. And it ain't a small shank either. <laughs> it's looking like crocodile dundee <laughs> but but the truth is is that she knew that you know no matter where she went she needed to have protection you know and that was just a part of society i keep thinking we keep coming back to this uh like what happened to this dude and about people with with influence in what whatever country or what might be and i don't know if uh, Michaela and Matt, are you, are you familiar with Pulp Fiction? Right? Yes, so, film of all time. So there's <laughs> there's the Marcellus, the, the whole thing between Tavolta and Samuel L. Jackson where they're talking about Marcellus Wa Wallace, right. right? The whole thing. I, we just watched this like a couple weeks ago. And so I'm good. Just like, just like, what does a foot rub mean, right? Yeah. Does it mean anything? Well, well, to Marcel, no, you don't fuck with Marcel's Wallace's wife, no matter yeah. what, you right. know. But it's just a foot rub. Foot rub don't mean like you sh maybe you shouldn't do it, but does that mean you get thrown out the window, right? And that's <laughs> right. like every time we keep coming right. back around to this, this all I'm picturing like the conversation between. But, but that's but that's what it is. Yeah, I mean anybody, especially when I'm abroad. I mean whether 
you know, KO's with me. I know KO can handle his business. But the thing is, if he came to visit me and I know the country, I know the neighborhood, he's on my time. Mm-hmm. He's in my hood. I got to make sure he's safe mm-hmm. right? or anybody else. If I, if I go to his neighborhood, it's the same thing. Well, the foot rub in, in, in the States might mean a lot different to the foot rub. <laughs> and, and well, that's a, but uh, Exactly. But that's right? the case. You have to know, you know what, what the custom is. Yes. What is the and, custom? Yeah. Right. And if that means, hey, you know what? You don't give Michaela foot rub. You don't give her a foot rub. Because you, know, you do that, you may have nubs for your hands. You're looking like Candyman. <laughs> Where's Cody right now? Cody's like, hold Cody's up. Cody's sitting in the other room. Like, who's rubbing Michaela's feet? Hold on one second. Cody, <laughs> Cody's just like, there need some missing motherfuckers up in here. Right? <laughs> but, I but, I mean, anyway. but, 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 you know, truth, truth be told, though, I really do live by, if I don't do it at home, I'm not going to do it abroad. I may not speak the language. You got to look to see if you being, you're being set up you know, by people. I mean, you never know. So I'd always try to figure out who's running the show on the team. Hmm. You know, at least as long as I can be professional and I'm cordial and I see what's going on and he might give me a head nod like, hey, you know what? You're cool. I know you ain't saying nothing. I'm not saying anything. That's not my business. Yeah. It is, it is one of those situations where when you're, you don't even know, like you're, John, you're saying a foot rub, even a conversation with someone. I know a friend of mine was in Tennessee not too long ago, and he said, you know, he's just chilling, some girls talking to him. He's married. His wife was like st- sitting right there. So he's kind of talking to this lady like in a kind way because she was just drunk. And he was just like the both of them were talking and then the one guy came over like almost wanting to fight him he's like that's my wife and he's like i we there was no conversation of any weird way we were talking about sports yeah. but like some people you know with that power comes that ego where you're like well you're not gonna i don't care who you are everyone in this bar saw you talking to her everyone in this bar saw you laughing with her and now they think i'm a punk and like that just can't be. So a lot of people are be like, nope. So it's it doesn't even matter if you engage in it. It's like someone you could just be talking to someone and get in the wrong situation. And it, like you said, if you don't know that custom, if you don't know who that is, like you you should have a teammate come up. If like you're in a situation where you're talking to someone's, you know, person, and that the, it's not a good situation, and you need someone to be like, yo, stop what you're doing and go to the bathroom and jump out the window. <laughs> Don't come back. Right. Like, you need to be gone. Let me ask you, you two guys, right? So you get these contracts to play overseas and everything. Do they give you any any type of training and talk about, like, hey, you're going to South Korea, Kevin. Like, say this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. I went to Europe in college twice to play uh, for, like, a tour, like, a music tour, and they sat us, we, they sat us down, and they were like, Hey, assholes, don't say this. Don't do this. We're going to go to this to this town. Don't order this off the menu. You know, they were like, all right, so we're in college or like, and one time I was in like high school, they sat us down. They were super like, hey, don't fuck up because you could really get hurt. Everything we're talking about. And they did. But for you guys, they were just like, here's some money and go. They didn't no type of education whatsoever. Do your own research. Back in the day, encyclopedias. I was going to say, there was no Google, on. right? No Google. Yeah. <laughs> there was no Google. Or <laughs> Ask Jeeves. Right, exactly. Oh, it was Ask Jeeves. You know? <laughs> so, we're, yeah, we're dating ourselves right now. But literally, yeah. <laughs> if you didn't have an exci- encyclopedia using Ask Jeeves, you really had no, you, you had no other you know, data unless you kind of knew somebody who played there. But back in the day, not everybody had a, an email address. You know, they didn't have regular access to you know computers. So you really had to just do your own dil- do your do your own personal diligence on what you needed to learn. So it's it's funny because like Aaron, we've had you on a couple of times to show you're extremely smart, mate. I, I could see you're still teaching and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, Kevin. You know, we've had a couple crazy nights, but nothing too crazy. But I can imagine <laughs> like someone like who's like on the edge who's ready to party and stuff like that with maybe not as level of a head going mm-hmm. to a bar speaking to the wrong woman 
um, and getting their ass beat and possibly killed. I could like absolutely see it, you know. Um, you know, I, I guess that plays into the story of uh, this guy we're talking about here tonight. What's his name? T- Tony. Tony, yeah. yeah. So, right. And combine that too with being a basketball player with an ego. You mm-hmm. you walk into uh, a yeah. situation, yeah, like you're in that situation, the, sprinkling the, a little alcohol, exactly. Yeah. You're like you're drunk, Maybe some and other then, stuff for other people involved, mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> Someone walks up to you, and it's like almost like, yo, that's my girl. It's almost like this ego trip kind of comes in, and you might mouth off and be like, then why is she talking to me? And right. you know, all drunk, and then it's just like you're put in a situation. Yeah, I love you guys, but obviously, I have the female perspective from all of this. And that doesn't change like the reality of how egotistical, you know, men can get about those kinds of things, but just don't treat women like property. And I think that's the most frustrating thing is seeing people get hurt because other people are being treated like property and like, you don't do that. Yeah. Respect and killing a dude over talking to your girlfriend are two totally different things. But is it, isn't that the custom? Like we we have had the privilege of growing up in America where well, at least at the very least, Michaela, we're starting to speak about women's rights, right? We're, we're starting to speak about it. But, but in other countries, say, right? are they having those conversations? Some countries are and some countries aren't. What it reminds me of is, you know, like movies like The Godfather and, you know, I mean, any kind of gang crime movies and media, they're not fiction like a lot of them are based on history and I think a reason that like Tony Harris's case you know even though it was a couple years ago if we think about something like now like the Gabby Petito thing how everyone is getting involved and they're getting on social media the mafia still exists but they're not signing up for Facebook profiles and you know doing their business via email or google drive or anything like that they're still operating there's just not a ton of media coverage on it because there isn't necessarily a footprint that more normal people not normal well i guess i'm gonna lock my doors tonight for sure <laughs> I'm like not calling the mafia normal but they're not getting involved because they have no way to interact with it the remaining media. Someone put out a, a like a tweet that I laughed at for like five minutes, and it's just like, who knew in the eighties that serial killers were just producing so much content? It was like yeah. I like laughed out loud because it's just it's so ridiculous and it's so scary. But like the eighty, like there's so many things people just could do whatever they wanted back then. Like it's like kind of what you know some of these countries are like now and haven't caught up. But like it's it's crazy to think about things like that occurring. I mean, obviously things like this occur all the time, mm-hmm. and a lot of it is from like a hot headed incident. I feel like most uh, situations where where there's crime or a, or like a murder or something is prob- is a lot of the time it's heat of the moment. It's you know something happened, you're immediately reacting, you're immediately mad, you immediately do something, and then as the days go and you're like. Well, it's almost like that contemplation, like, shit, if I just held off, I would have been fine. I wasn't thinking clearly. Um, and that, because you know you're going to get caught. Like, we live in a society now where, like, you're not, there's no serial killers anymore because, like, every, it's like, oh, someone was murdered here. Everyone checked their ring, and there's, like, 7,000 people on the block with ring cameras. Are like, oh, there he is. There he is again. There he is. It's like a clear picture. So it's just not the same uh, as it is you know, as it was in the 80s, where people were just like walking, sneaking into people's backyards and going to their house. uh, Not to freak you out, Michaela. But you know what I mean? (laughs) Honestly, I think we're desensitized to it as Americans, too, because like murder mystery and everything is so mainstream now to be into these things. Like there were, you know, a lot of conversations in like media theory that like when Zac Efron played Ted Bundy in that movie, like, you know, and women were thirsting over him. And it's like, you're glamorizing someone who hurt people and hurt a lot of families. And a lot of those families are probably still grieving and they don't get a chance to because it's it's news and it's, it's movies and it's TV and film. So as much as I enjoy those things and I learn a lot from them, it's kind of sad when we put it into a perspective of we're making entertainment out of scary, real shit. Well, I mean, I'm going to date myself. 
<laughs> in the 80s, in the late 80s, there's a show called Unsolved Mysteries. Scared the shit out of me. Yeah. So, but that was, that's like the earliest show that I can remember that was in some ways of kind of glamorizing a little bit, or at least telling the story of these mysteries that they, that had been unsolved. Yeah. And then of course, you know, we had, um, what was it? It came on with cops, but it was after it was, um, you know, looking for, you know, different suspects. I can't remember the name of it, but it came on and there was a guy who used to go ahead and talk about, you know, if you've seen this person call this, you know, number. Oh yeah. America's yeah. America's yeah. America's most wanted. wanted. Yeah. So, you know, you, you had that as well. What was it? So the, the, there's a show, I think it's called Clickbait on uh, Netflix yeah. right now. And I love that. It's, it's a great show. If, if anyone out there hasn't watched it yet and you're looking for a good mystery. Yeah, Vinny Chase is nice back. Movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, it's it was it's basically like, like Aaron was just saying, you know, it starts out as like, you know, we're just trying to find, you know, like that the America's Most Wanted or Unsolved Mysteries, trying to make people in the country aware but the clickbait was like was saying like how people in podcasts and people who uh, you know like using the internet to help you solve a crime now some people see things that you know like a de- detective overlooks this but someone knows what this sign over here on John Hunt's like you know podcast that he recorded in 2022 you know like oh that said that you know he had his his basement painted by such and such a company you know it, it's really interesting now like so there is so much out there but it's become a big thing like internet sleuthing right you know people just trying to figure it all out uh, there's a no, new show look at freaking uh I don't, I don't know if anyone's watching this one but Anne marie loves this one uh with martin short and steve martin and uh S- selena gomez I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Some a friend of mine said it was good, but I haven't watched it yet. It's like a, a podcast within a podcast within a podcast about like murder mysteries or whatever. I I don't love it. Shh, don't tell Anne Marie, but I'll sit there and watch <laughs> it with her. You know what I mean? Just you keep know, smiling uh, when it's on. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I gotta be honest, I'm like freaking Martin Short and Steve Martin. You're like you know this should be. I, mean, I don't know. Like it's it's okay. So it's all come. It's 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 a huge industry. It's a huge industry that people are making a ton of money off of. Um, and I think it started off of trying to help people, as Aaron was saying, you know, like Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted. What did they just took off? Uh, not Cops. What's the other one that everyone was watching? I think uh, Cops is coming back, actually. Cops is coming back? Oh, I'm shit. pretty sure they're bringing it back. What's the other one? Uh, Live PD. Has anyone watch that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah. yeah. And yep. some, I don't know if this is true, but someone told me the other day we were having this conversation that apparently they caught something on film that they weren't supposed to catch. And then they tried to hide the film, right? Like they took the body right. cameras and like deleted the footage and then they got caught. So live PD is like over. Listen, if, if I'm wrong out there, let us say like, I don't know. This is like <laughs> six hand information. Tune in, tune in, tune in next podcast as we uh, <laughs> solve the mystery of John's disappearance after That's right, here's right? the podcast. There's people walking around my house right now. <laughs> Kevin and uh, Aaron, did you guys ever experience anything remotely close to like, a crazy story like this while playing overseas in any particular country? Uh, man, we had our crazy stuff. And so you have to be a little more specific. <laughs> are, are you talking about like death? Like, like almost... <laughs> What you Every could time say you would be almost like right. <laughs> like it's always like the the fear of not coming home, right? Yeah. Have, have you ever we went out had Philly. a teammate? Have Who you knows, had like a, right? <laughs> have you ever had like a teammate or a friend playing overseas that has reached out to you and said, "There's a, I'm not, I don't feel safe right now where I'm at." Not so much of not feeling safe, just uh, more so of I haven't been paid. What do you think I should do? At this point, there's been more of those phone calls that have been made um, or messages sent because you got to remember the, these are the days of AOL, AOL Messenger was still hanging hanging on. You still had MSN Messenger. You had only a couple of um, you know applications where you could actually call people in different places. So usually it was you know literally picking up the phone and somebody calling or it was an email. But um, in terms of like not feeling safe, I never had anything i'm not feeling safe other than like me personally like being in in venezuela that's just it's just uh uh 
a violent place. So, and they told you, don't go on the streets at night. Don't do this. Don't do that. Um, if you go anywhere, go with guys on the team because they know. And, and that's that's what that was. But other than that, no. Venezuela. So you said that's the scariest place that you've been? Yeah, and I was only there for, for a little bit. Mm. But it was just, you know, it's just a, a violent place, you know, being close to Caracas. Well, we were talking about this earlier, and then we kind of got off, off of it. But you guys remember the Wilson Ramos case? He was, I don't remember he was, that. He was the Is that the, yeah, I'm right. I, yes, yes. And I was thinking about it. We're talking about you guys, Americans, going and playing overseas and getting, like, kidnapped, right? Or something bad happened. But what about someone who comes here and makes a shit ton of money, and then they, they go home? His family. Yeah. Yeah. Venezuela. And they, they kidnapped him. Right? Yeah. 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 That's right. For like I, did two hear, days. I did hear about that. Um, and like he was, he was, he was a nationals catcher. I think he was a catcher for the nationals in yeah. like 2011, if I'm not mistaken, this mm-hmm. dude got like nabbed while he was home. And like, that's crazy. Like, this is where I grew up or whatever. I went away. I, I made something out of myself. I come home and now I'm getting kidnapped because I did well. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just looked up the article and they, he was saying how he had like commandos, like busting through like the friggin' like doors and the rescued him. And then he came back and played national, uh, you know, national league baseball the next year. So that's crazy. <laughs> that's like the other end of it. Right. Yeah. But I mean, you heard the stories with, uh, with Ginobili, you know, he had moved, uh, um, yep. for the most part, his family were in San Antonio. I played against his brother in Argentina, Sebastian, and you know, he'd play. So, you know, I don't know what the situation was. And I know he's uh, he's now coaching. He's been retired for a few years and he's coaching down in Argentina. But, you know, the DH, moved his from, uh, the DH from Boston, um, Poppy. Yeah. Yes. He get shot, mm-hmm. right. Or he, he almost got popped in a bar or something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, just it depends on where you're at, because you have certain places where, you know, I was just in the Dominican, you know, you're getting a haircut for three dollars. You know, so for, th- for literally three U.S. dollars, you're able to get a haircut and they're looking at it as they're making good money. So you look at, OK, I make. I don't know, maybe 100 bucks for the day, maybe $50 for the day. And that's a great day. You got somebody making multi millions. You, know, you can't even you know imagine that like the number just doesn't make any sense to you. So, I definitely- yeah, let me go. Ahead, let me go ahead and, and kidnap KO for a little bit. I ain't yeah. going to hurt him. Uh-huh. I just want to go ahead and have him in the house for a little bit and so I can get a couple dollars and then I'll you know I'll give him back. And it's true. There's there's it's a simple way to to kind of make money over there, especially if you're just kind of like, listen, you know, I'm not gonna hurt you. Just just you know, this is what it's gonna be, but we need some money. You know, this people are willing to pay you this much. They obviously value you and your life. So I need to get I need to make some money off that. And it's like you said, there's the people are living so impoverished down there at what point is crime almost like a necessity just to kind of get by uh when you're just like you have nothing and there's no no like help and it's there's no jobs there's no nothing you're just kind of like all right i need to you know do things that might not be the best things well i mean i I agree i mean you you because i mean there's those places that we go to and you just kind of think like okay well i understand why people are hustling and Matt, I'm going to jump into your question too, as uh, because there's something I didn't put in the book, and it's weird because I, I was going to put in a book, and then I was like, you know what, I'm not going to because I felt like I had a good relationship with them after the fact, and I talked a little bit about them and how they're crazy, but like I didn't mention them personally uh, in terms of this actual specific situation. So when I was in Kosovo, same thing, Aaron. Like that was like. It was, everyone's ha- carries, you know, everyone's got a gun. Right. You're, you know that they, they, they're they all, you know, they don't, it's like, they're, it's a very uh, old school way of fighting. Like they don't, they carry just in case, like it's the old West, but like when you're, when stuff's going down and they're at a game, they're going to take it out because they'll just going to, they're just going to put brass knuckles on and like beat the shit out of each other. Mm-hmm. They don't need a gun. They don't need it going off. They're just going to fight that way. But uh, we were at a we were at a dinner, so we were playing. Uh, when I got there, um, they brought the imports in. I guess around January, and they brought three imports in. We were played for Sigal Pristina, which is like the biggest team, the best team. 
uh, there. They're now in Euro League and stuff like that. Well, we went, didn't lose a game the entire time, played through the Kosovo League, a uh, few other leagues, and won every single game. We got to the finals, and it's like 3 1 or 3 0 uh, for best of seven. We won the first thing. We're playing at their place. They were hitting every crazy shit shot you can imagine. Just like it was like their day. Like you couldn't, they mm-hmm. couldn't miss. We lost by like two. Everyone, like our fans made us come to dinner and like sat us down. And like the guy leaned forward, his like has the holstered gun right here, like took off his jacket and just leaned forward like this and was just like to the Americans, like, why do we lose? He's like, really, like, almost like a very menacing, threatening kind of way. He's like, we are not going to lose again. Like, this is unacceptable. We do not lose. And I was like, maybe he just he just did that because that's how he talks. Maybe he did, mm-hmm. you know, the gun's so natural for him, it didn't. But for us, we're like, what the fuck? Like, where are we? Because that was very, it was very intimidating. It was one of those things where I was like, am I going to get, like, the same thing like am i gonna get murdered if we lose in like the final so needless to say we're like let's get the fuck out of here we went won the next game and like pretty that was the same thing we're like we're gone like we are out but after i kind of like talked to that like i almost got home and they wrote me on facebook and they were like very appreciative and very kind so i was like i'm not gonna like blow them up obviously it's a podcast like who knows if they're ever gonna listen to this and if they do i mean uh, that was nothing disrespectful. I just it was a scary ass experience from my perspective to be like, holy shit, am I going to get gunned down for losing a game when I'm like legitimately the last person who would ever get shot for playing basketball? I'm like, where, what am I doing right now? That was when I really started questioning things. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Oh, man. But. Aaron, this was fun. Obviously, uh, it's it's always fun because I feel like like we talked about before. Aaron and I have talked, you know, had long conversations on the phone. We both were drafting the D League together. We've had a we've developed a great friendship, and you know, now we're kind of all part of the same team, which is awesome because you know we're all trying to you know be successful. I've thrown a lot of ideas off Aaron and we, we still are connected today. It's really fun. Uh, we're super excited to have you on. I knew and it was funny because I was like, we're going through this. And I was like, I, uh, you know, talking, I was like, who can I text? And like, who would know something about this? Who would be able to like hop on with it? like a, a, someone I would be like, Hey, I, that's my friend. I'll hop on. And I was like, I'm right. texting Aaron. <laughs> so immediately. I mean, you, you got to think. So when I got started, you know, when I came out of school in 01, internet wasn't everywhere still. Yeah. So when you when you had to go and use like the computer, you'd have to go to the internet cafe at the local telephone spot, and they may have a computer that you could use that was on dial-up. <laughs> and that was your your way of being able to at least send out an email, let people know, hey, I'm safe. Yeah, I told you I'd email you at this day, this time, every you know, I'm safe. Everything's cool. Had a couple games, update, and your time was up. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, and so with, with the stories that you know we're talking about, the stuff would go on. I mean, you can speak about guys who would reinvent themselves everywhere they would go prior to the internet because they could be whoever they wanted to be. Yeah. With the internet, you can't change up your style too much because people. Oh, I know you played here. You played here. You did this. You did that. You got in trouble here. You did that. So people know everything that you've done, Mm -hmm. you know, so you can't, you know, you really can't hide anything, but you know, we played in the same time. We saw all the stuff going on. So it's very easy. It's, Hey, you know what? I I know I can go ahead and call KO because I know he's going to know something about this. Yeah, it's, it's true. I think that it's like that golden age. I always look at it like, you know, I, we had Max DeLeo. I know TJ DeLeo, Tony DeLeo was with the, uh, Sixers for a while. Uh, He was a coach overseas, played overseas. It's like you kind of had that error, but like there was, it was so few and far between the leagues. And I feel like our error, we were in that there's teams starting to really expand to different countries and basketball was really developing. We were kind of into that Dirk Nowitzki really becoming a star uh, Mm -hmm. area where people started looking to Europe to be like, holy shit, this is this whole thing. And it's fun to kind of be part of that 
uh, like that almost when this whole entire uh, renaissance of Europe, European basketball came where everyone started becoming enlightened to what's going on over there uh, in terms of like, oh, this guy's playing here, this guy's playing here. Now you look at what it is now where while the stories of Americans aren't totally there yet and we're still working on that, you still have, you have your Lucas and everyone knows that there's there's this talent over here now or over there now that uh, is just yet to yet to really be discovered. So it's super cool. Yeah, because, you know, Dirk's, Dirk's a few months older than me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, Dirk's, you know, he's 43. Yeah, I'll be 43 at the end of the year. But, you know, that was somebody who, you know, came out. They decided to say, hey, you know, this kid can play. And I remember watching Dirk. It's like, okay, he's a seven-foot shooter. Go get a rebound. <laughs> you know, I didn't care if he shot the ball, but go rebound. And for a while when he played, because the Mavs were awful, he'd end up with like 20 points, 20 rebounds. Yeah. And that was what he would do. And that was just off of the fact that he was seven feet. And, that, and we can play percentages and statistics. If you put your hands up enough times, it's it's going to fall into your hands. <laughs> it's true. Trust me. I, I know you're very good. I was, a, I was a good, I was a good <laughs> rebounder. It wasn't just because I was at like uh strong. It was mainly right, but, but I was as tall. you know, rebounding from when we played in the D league, with NBA rules compared to, you know, playing abroad. Yeah. It's a completely different way of rebounding because NBA, you're not necessarily having to, you know, check anybody. No. Not necessarily having to box out. It's people running down court. You get it. You know, that's it. You're playing abroad. You got to use your fundamentals. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Those guys, everyone's, it's just like, that's, you always play that European guy who, who's, who's just like tenacious, who doesn't stop. We talk about Luca and people are like kind of disrespect his game sometimes. And you're like, you're like, well, this, you know, look at, he doesn't look like he's trying hard, but he really is like he's right. in every single play. Cause he puts himself in the position to be in every single play. And it's just, it's, it's crazy how these uh, European guys have really developed and the game is developed, but uh, it's been awesome. Aaron, thanks so much for hopping on today. No, nah, thanks for having um, me guys. I appreciate yeah, talking it. About this Tony Harris case, and you know, going over some of these facts, and it's, uh, it was interesting to kind of hear your perspective, being that you were in the country next to it, and kind of hear this uh, information, and you're kind of like, "Holy shit, it's crazy." Yeah, I mean, you know, at, because at, at that time, you know, there's also the uh, the South American Cup. So yeah. depending on where you played, your region might have been Argentina, might have been Brazil, might have been Venezuela. I'm trying to think. I I don't know. If, Chile had a team. I don't think they had a team, but I think Uruguay had had a uh, a team. So you had four locations that you might pop into. And I know with the teams I played on, we never qualified, you know, for it because it was always the season before. Mm-hmm. But if you were going to one of those places, you knew what was what was it, you know, going to happen. You knew the expectations. Damn, South America, it's crazy. I know a lot of guys who played down there. You included. Uh, it is. It's it's a it's a place where you don't realize uh when you go that you're you're kind of putting a lot on the line and nothing none of it has to do with basketball so yeah it's crazy well aaron thank you so much hey, uh I we'll be in it. touch it was awesome having you check out aaron uh for everything on the on his blog uh check out what he's doing still playing still dominating thanks so much aaron hey it's a pleasure i'll see you guys all right thanks aaron so man, we got a uh, we got some good information uh, today. This Tony Harris case, it, it's it's a weird one. Uh, we were talking before we hopped on how not many people know about it because when I when you Google things about like things that happen to overseas athletes, you don't find this. This is like very specific, and there's only a few things about it out there. Um, and a lot of the information that we kind of talk about are like through players that we know and we hear, and there's like the facts that the police say, but like a lot of it is here saying things from guys who were playing at the time who were kind of like, Oh shit, I heard this because like we said, it's a small community. It's crazy. How are we doing guys? I know it's like, <laughs> it feels like one o'clock in the morning. I know it's, You could tell like sun's going down earlier. Like everyone's like ready. for. <laughs> I was going to say, like, every time we hear a case like this, like, my dad is um, a correctional officer in a federal prison, so very few things shock me 
and more <laughs> as far as like yes true crime but also like what the human mind is capable of like when I like read the part where it said like you know hung himself by a shoelace I was like that can't and then I was like like going back in my dad's story archive I'm like okay like someone could actually like do that mm-hmm. um, so yeah and I think I think American culture was extremely desensitized to violence and stuff like that too but at the same time it's weird how things like this and Gabby Petito like kind of bring people together in a strange morbid way because everybody mm-hmm. wants justice to be served to some extent yeah I I agree because I I just don't know how like when the family of Tony Harris like that is that has to be the toughest thing and I always I obviously you know you're 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 never you, hopefully you'll never be in the situation or any of you will ever be in the situation but as a family to think about you know having something and you don't know the concept or you don't know exactly what happened like there's no closure it's like living your entire life being like well what if this happened what if this happened and never getting that closure to be like okay it went this way or this way now i it's closure now i can start moving on it's constantly sitting there and being like well you know what would happen if this happened what would i do who did it what it's just it's it's a tough life to to go through that um and leave behind family who are going to be you know dealing with that for a long time just a little safety tip for everyone too if you do travel out of the country you can register your passport um with it's called um smart traveler enrollment program and it is like a state government entity so that way you would tell them like the dates of your trip and who you're going with and everything like that so you can have your info saved and docketed so if you don't like respond to your family or something like that there's some kind of tracking i like that not only are we you know talking a little you know some some overseas stories we're also have some overseas safety tips for you guys and don't go to South America, <laughs> apparently. Stay the fuck away. Uh, Venezuela. Yeah, exactly. Well, guys, we burned the midnight oil tonight. We did it. I'm super proud. We There was, like, so many things. We were all kind of like, it's just tough. Like, we have, you know, Matt, you're a college student. Michaela, you're, Matt's you know. Matt's sitting over here going, it's 9 fucking 58. <laughs> and he just said, burn the midnight oil. <laughs> <laughs> I had an early morning. I had 645 <laughs> conditioning, 45 Oof. minutes of suicide. Oh, so <laughs> man. Not fun. I, I honestly thought I was like, Matt's just like, all right, guys, like, I'm going to go pregame for in a few minutes. And <laughs> I fucking had to out, my like, three little boys to go mini golfing tonight, man. It's it's the same. Uh, like, <laughs> I felt yeah. like I, I'm fucking exhausted. <laughs> it, it is. Like, we, you just hit that point where you're become like an old person where you're just like, you think about anything that occurs after like six o'clock is just it's it's just like a burden in your life. Like Olivia has soccer practice at seven o'clock. She's eight. And I'm like, why the fuck is she practicing at seven o'clock at night? Like, I can't believe. So then she's like done and she's all fired up. And I'm like, I'm so tired. We just go to right, right to bed. It's like so late. Who has time for all this anymore? But I am proud of you guys. You, you know, you did it. We did it. We uh we got this out. Uh, big thanks to Aaron um, again. Uh, this whole case with Tony Harris, we wanted to obviously um, you know do so with the utmost respect to his family and his loved ones. Uh, just trying to figure out you know some of the the details that we heard, uh, players heard that uh, his that are out there in terms of facts. We we're trying to bring that all together to kind of, you know, have you guys know what goes on overseas and be the voice as we always are of overseas athletes. So John, Matt, Michaela, you guys are awesome. Uh, Aaron, awesome. And we thank you guys so much for listening. Tune in next week as we do some more fun shit. And next week we'll be drinking beers hopefully before six o'clock in the afternoon in the evening. Peace out guys. Overseas famous later.